Thank you. Um, I actually had a question about the minutes, or maybe it's just my misunderstanding about whatever we did last time. I thought that we had agreed at some point at the end, and maybe we just didn't, that all of the four proposals that we liked all of them, but that John, you and I, am not sure who else was going to try and kind of condense them into one thing that went to Sean. Yeah. Or did I make uh, that up or did, was that? It, and I no, you, you did not make it up, Carol. Um, the truth is that I didn't get around to doing it. On the other hand, I'm not sure at this point, or even if we'd done it earlier, it would make any difference. Um, I believe that Sean, well, I'm pretty sure Sean went ahead and proposed his spending plan to town council maybe last Monday, I'm not quite sure when. And what I don't actually know is uh, um, whether uh, town council approved the spending plan. And then, and this is something to ask Nate when he comes online, if he knows. And then if they did approve it, when we actually uh, get to give our detailed recommendation on what should be done with the money that theoretically we have some responsibility for, which would be both uh, uh, a million dollars related to addressing issues for homelessness and a million dollars addressing issues related to affordable housing. So whatever the four things that we proposed is still in the background. It never got far for, which is fine. I just, yeah, yeah it, that's fine. It, it was kind of unnecessary because Sean did not want to provide more detail yeah. okay. to town cool. council. And uh, the first of the four goes under that rubric of uh, programs to address homelessness and the other three go under the rubric of uh, promoting more affordable housing. Okay, so thank I'm you. Thanks for I'm the clarification. Guessing, I'm guessing that uh, it'll be on our January agenda, but I don't know. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see Mindy has also joined us. That is Representative Mindy Dom, who I think of as Mindy because I knew her before she was our state rep. <laughs> okay, so I did say we should review minutes from the last meeting. Um, I distributed those. Any comments or questions about those minutes? They were prepared by Lucia and I made a few editorial changes. Nothing really very significant before I distributed them. Okay, if there are no questions or comments, then I think we will, as usual, um, regard them as accepted, uh, as submitted. Okay, so that brings us to uh, the next order of business, which is discussion of the town comprehensive housing policy. Um, and I'm gonna make, take a shot at sharing my screen. Huh. I'm looking for something I prepared before this meeting that is a list of things that I wanted to share and I'm not seeing it come up. Yeah, I see it in my Sorry. 
And see, I did send it to you. Can you share the screen on this? Um, what is the document? Housing trust priorities for the town comprehensive housing policy or from the town housing comprehensive housing policy. Uh, so while Lucia is seeing if she can share the document, uh, I'll just say why I, uh, uh, why I wanted to bring this up, uh, at all. Basically, um, I think that while much of what's there is already consistent with things that we're doing, I think we should try to identify things that we definitely regard as priorities and that we may want to own as the town works on implementing this, uh, this policy, because that really is the next step. Thanks, Lucia. So, okay, so we need to identify what to set as priorities. Um, and I did a little bit of a draft of that, which we'll take a look at in a minute. A second thing we need to think about is how and when to communicate to town council about what we wanna take ownership or responsibility for. And the policy itself really goes beyond affordable housing. And so, we just need to be cautious about the fact that our statutory responsibility is affordable housing. I guess the other thing that I didn't list here that we need to be cautious about, which I wasn't necessarily in putting together this list, is not taking on too much. As I said, a lot of what's here is already uh, on our plate. So we need to think carefully about what we want to add. Uh, questions about that? I just, if our statutory responsibility is affordable housing with the capital A or not, I mean, is it just subsidized housing or is it any housing that is affordable? No, I think it's um, subsidized housing. Okay. Anything that is for uh, individuals or households that are generally 80% AMI or below, although it could also count 200%, oh, sorry, 100% AMI or below, but not below that. And uh, not, not above. In a, yeah, not above that. Not, not inappropriately though, the, the policy does set some goals for um, people who are at a higher level of income. Um, but that is, at least not according to the state statute and not according to uh, the town bylaw is something that is identified as part of our responsibility. Thank you. Okay, so most of it is really, a lot of it is on this first page. And as I said, um, this is all things for the most part that we're already doing. Um, even if the language is a little different. So uh, I'm not going to read it, or I'll just kind of briefly allude to these things. Production of diverse housing types as alternatives to single dwelling homes. So that's part of the policy. Um, reducing the occurrence of rental conversion of single family homes which is something we may or may not want to be responsible for. Um, working with stakeholder in town to pr increase production of starter homes and other options. Uh, and starter homes doesn't necessarily mean, in fact, it probably doesn't mean in this context, single family homes. It can mean uh, doing a condominium development, for example, for new homeowners or other things that we might do that's targeted toward 
uh, new homeowners. Uh, partnerships is something that uh, we also uh, have been doing and I assume will continue to do. The, uh, the specific policy, at least in this location, mentions seniors, singles, and disabled residents. And I just added in italics, persons who are unhoused as well. Uh, and they are mentioned later in the document, but I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, the policy places a major emphasis on uh, homes that go into the subsidized housing inventory, which I'm pretty sure is 80% AMI, although under some circumstances, it could also include 100%, but I'm not sure about that. Um, the policy though, as I mentioned earlier, references people earning 120% AMI or older or lower. And we're not doing that. We are doing 100%, for example, in the East Street Belchertown Road development. Um, building racial and social equity into planning, uh, ensuring that barriers are reduced is something that I think we've already started to do some work on. I'm not sure we've actually done much or have any plans to do the seventh item. So that's something that we have to decide. Um, under each of these, if I'm gonna send a note to town council, I would probably wanna cite things that we're already doing. So, you know, we have the Belchertown Road East Street School Project. While it's not exactly our project, we have worked to promote the Valley Community Development Studio Apartments that uh, are next to the Amherst College campus. Um, again, the second thing, I'm not sure we've done anything related to that and whether we're gonna be in a position to do so. And so this is a place where, and other places obviously, where I'm looking for what you all think about what we should be doing and whether we should be formally, formally telling town council, okay, this is on our list. So I'm gonna stop and give a chance for comment and not sort of steamroll everybody by just keeping on talking. Okay, no comments. I was, um, I was yeah. gonna say in, uh, on, in regard to number two, which I agree with in principle, I guess like what would that look like action steps wise for us? Like it's, I mean, are we gonna go bully like the realtors to say like, you can't, um, you can't sell to investors? Um, are we gonna like, well, how, how that be operational, I guess, operationalized? There, there are some things the town can do. Um, for example, we could the town could change the tax structure so that if single family homes are not owner occupied, the tax rate could be higher. Which that is they declined to do recently, correct? They voted that down a few weeks ago. Am I wrong in thinking that? I don't recall that, Allegra. I think that may have been something else that had to do with differential rates for uh, uh, commercial versus residential property. Okay, I thought there was think, a residential exemption in there as well. No, if, if they did what I'm describing, actually, they would need um, a special uh actually new statutory authority to do that from the state legislature and the city of somerville is seeking that as mindy pointed out to me so thanks to mindy for pointing that out to me um that's an example of something that the town could do 
again, whether we want to do something developing a proposal along those lines or leave it, for example, to the uh, special task force that Pam Rooney wants to uh, appoint. Hypothetically, along those lines, like I know statewide, they're talking about the kind of luxury real estate tax or whatever they're deeming it. Is that something that could potentially be like a bylaw that the town council could create and and make it so that Amherst does that regardless of what the rest of the state does? No. Um, okay. <laughs> as you said, there's, there's a state statute pending yeah. and it's gradually getting more and more interest among various towns and cities in the Commonwealth, um, but they need to have legislative authority to be able to pass that. And then it would become a local option. Yeah. So if the state passes the relevant statute, then Amherst could elect to do uh, the, it would really be a, an additional tax or fee on luxury home sales. It wouldn't be on the value of homes until they're actually sold. And uh, uh, things would need to be decided, which is what's the line, so to speak? Is it half a million dollars in sale value? Less than that, more than that to be subject to this real estate transaction fee? Um, and what the percentage of the sale price <coughs> And the state statute would actually um, offer some options that towns could adopt. But we're still not there yet. <coughs> and actually, Somerville, again, is leading the charge, uh, to the best of my knowledge, on trying to get that bylaw passed. <coughs> so I guess this is an area where we could do something, which is to say we could join with other towns um, in doing that advocacy at a state level. And actually, to some extent, I have done that, uh, but not necessarily as aggressively as we might. Um, but there needs to be more interest, I think, among towns and commonwealth before the legislature is likely to pass the two changes we were just discussing. <coughs> But potentially we could come up with other things that would um, create more of a price, if you like, um, for doing rental conversion of single family homes. Okay, the third item is something that we're definitely already hoping to do. Um, this isn't necessarily the language that we apply, but for example, um, where we are hoping to be able to use property on Strong Street to create, um, say, a condominium development that would allow home ownership. Uh, that would be an example of something that fits under three. Because uh, uh, likely those would be starter homes. They'd be primarily available to uh, households that are new in the market for purchasing homes. So I definitely think that belongs on our list. Other comments? Uh, let's see, the other thing I would say about three is um, the initiatives that Carol mentioned earlier in the meeting about use of ARPA funds also would be focused on home ownership, whether it comes through a project like uh, Strong Street or it comes through the kind of one household after one household with the projects that Rob was talking about at our last meeting. All of those also are examples of trying to increase the availability of starter homes uh, in the community. Let's see. Uh, number four, 
again, we've been doing partnerships. Um, for example, our most recent RFP, which I'll talk a little bit about the status of a little bit further down on the agenda, is now uh, an example of trying to do something that meets the needs of particular population in the community. Um, so we do want to continue, I assume, to pursue these kinds of partnerships. Um, and it can be through an RFP process, or it can be something like Valley Community Development initiated with its Amherst Studio Apartment Project, um, where we kind of stand in support of what they want to do. We endorse requests for support from uh, the Community Preservation Act Committee, and we try to organize uh, constituents or advocates in the community to oppose people who try to block the project. So again, that's all stuff that we have been doing and I, I'm guessing we would continue to do. Any comments? Okay, then we have the fifth item. Um, and again, that can be uh, uh, some of these, there's redundancy across these items, I will say that, but can, creation of homes can be um, doing new building stock, or I would consider, again, the kinds of projects that Rob talked about that the American Community, I'm sorry, Amherst Community Land Trust uh, has initiated or Habitat for Humanity, uh, or uh, uh, Valley Community Development. All of them have done things, although generally you're talking about 80% of area median income or 60% or lower. We really don't have projects and are not likely to have projects that are as high as 120% AMI. But again, that's something that we have been doing. Any comments? If, um, if there were a, like a condominium sort of some kind of situation, could there not be one in which some of the units were 80% and some were up to 120%? So there was a mix? Um, there could be. Um, I guess, yeah, so if we do an RFP for a condominium development, we would do something similar to what we did with Beltratown Road and East Street right. School, where we allow units on the Beltratown Road property that are up to 100% of area median income, uh, or on the East Street School where we might actually get some market rate units because that isn't restricted with respect to income. So yeah, there's no reason we couldn't have that. And in fact, to the extent that DHCD um, looks at new projects and says, well, there's only so much subsidy we'll provide. And if you can actually put more units up well, make the other ones market rate because we're not going to subsidize them. So I would say at this point, Carol, that's definitely possible. Cool, that's good. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, number six build racial and social equity, et cetera, into uh, planning. I, I think, again, some of this we do automatically by assuring that the housing is available to people with lower incomes. When we did the RFP for uh, East Street Belchertown Road site, one of the things we did is require the developers to do special out 
reach to uh, individuals or households of color, for example, um, so that it's not simply low income, but we're also trying to uh, build in racial equity as well as social equity. And again, I'm guessing that that's something we would try to be able to continue to do. There are limitations, but the fact is that uh, when a developer builds a pool of people who are eligible for a new development, uh, they end up probably uh, randomly selecting folks to come in. And I don't think we can put in a racial or ethnic bias into that selection. But the one thing we can do is require that they do a lot of outreach. So the pool <clears throat> definitely includes um, different racial and ethnic groups than you might get if you didn't put much effort into it. And then uh, we have the seventh item, actively acting to eliminate discrimination in housing. Now, actually, the predecessor group, or maybe the predecessor of the predecessor group to the Housing Trust, um, was a fair housing committee in town. And we've never really adopted that as, uh, as a goal for this group. And if we did that, I'm not quite sure what we would do, but we don't have a fair housing group anymore in Amherst. And uh, an interesting question is um, whether there should be a fair housing group and whether that should be a responsibility of the housing trust. When we did the educational forum on racial equity, the, um, the woman who served as the kind of mistress of ceremonies, uh, uh, Isolda Ortega Bustamante, or Bustamante Ortega, I'm forgetting the right order of her last name. But anyway, she talked about a problem that she and her husband had when they purchased the house that they're currently in. And they were unable to get a loan despite the, despite the fact that they were fully employed. And Isolda believed that that was a consequence of uh, discrimination, although there wasn't necessarily a way to prove it. And they were able to purchase the house because the people who owned the house agreed to um, give them a loan. To hold the mortgage, yeah. Right, to hold the mortgage so that they could pay off. And uh, again, I don't know if there's a way for us to get actively involved in that kind of situation, but it's definitely a fair housing issue. Um, and certainly a solder raising it made me more conscious of the fact that even in liberal Amherst, uh, the realtors and the banks don't necessarily uh, do the best job in assuring access to uh, communities of color. So that hasn't gone away. Uh, it's, it's historically a problem and it may still be a problem. Um, I should say, I, I, I actually talked a little bit to Rita who couldn't be in this meeting. Uh, and she made a very good point about some of these things. And that is, if they are things we're gonna do we should do them to some extent in collaboration with other groups or individuals in town. So for example, number seven is a perfect one for the uh, Human Rights Committee of which Sid is a crossover member. So if we wanna do some kind of initiative there, I think it would mean that we would uh, work with Sid and with Ben Harrington, who's the chair of the committee and potentially other members of the committee to rough out some kind of plan for what we might want to do. Again, it yeah, just it, adds, it, 
add something to our plate. So I agree. I, I, I you know, um, a lot of uh, the discussion we've been having on the other group is about how do we do more education around some of these issues. And a lot of this, you know, looking at eliminating discrimination in housing, it's education, right? It's, it's about bringing the lenders in, bringing the banks in and educating them how how it can be better for the community to have a diversified community. And I agree with you that this would be a really great project between um, the Housing Trust and others and, and the, 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 the Human Rights Commission. So I think that um, Ben and most of us would welcome that to tell the truth. Okay, so that's something potentially to put on our agenda. And again, I, I don't know because we have yet to have the new town council seated what uh mandy joe who was the person who was principally responsible for the new town policy or other people might have to say about what initiative they expect to take you know either through a task force like i described pam rooney wanting to undertake or through some other uh town council initiative So those are the first seven. There aren't many more that I would strongly endorse. On the other hand, uh, I think as I said earlier, I, uh, I made the list probably over-inclusive. And so we really do need to be careful about what it is we actually uh, wanna do. Uh, I, I remember uh one point with committees like this is that in part people need to vote with their feet that is they need to say okay uh i think this is important and not only do i think it's important but i'd like to take some initiative in pursuing it okay any other comments about these first seven Okay, let's move down. Uh, let's see it to the second page. Um, yeah, sorry, you're moving down a little too far. So they're still on the first page. Uh, okay, so we're talking about goal Roman numeral two. And what I pulled out of that is the idea of working with institutions of higher education, particularly UMass, and uh, again, this relates to an issue I mentioned earlier, which is uh, we've got students taking considerable advantage of existing housing in Amherst. It's led to occupation of what historically were starter family homes. Um, and it's because they don't have enough options on campus. Uh, there were at least two articles, one that Nick Grabby wrote in the Amherst Current and another one that appeared in the Collegian about students going as far as Holyoke or Springfield to be able to find housing. And I'm talking about students on the UMass campus. So uh, that's not very convenient. Uh, in fact, it probably undermines their capacity actually to to be students. So it's not only a problem for the town of Amherst, but it's really a problem for uh, undergraduate and graduate students at the university who need housing. So um, this is what's in the policy. I don't disagree with any of it. The question is, what, if anything related to this, do we wanna take on? Does this kind of remain in the portfolio of things that uh, we see as something that should be a responsibility of the Housing Trust to participate in, to take the lead in? What do people think? I tend to imagine that the town has more pull to do any of those things and that 
our job would be to be supportive as as asked or something like that. I don't I don't it just doesn't seem like a place where we would shine at being the whatever you okay. call it the lead people. Yeah, I see a note I, I on my screen that sorry, Sid, go ahead. No, I was going to say I tend to agree with with Carol that this would be more on on the area of town gown relationships and and have those two groups work on it. Um, and then, as Carol said, then we would be supportive more of of you know what what the town side, what the town decides um, to go with. But I, I could see more of a town gown relationship area um, type of of action. Okay. Linda Slakey had her hand raised, so I'm going to recognize her and see what she has to suggest about this. Well, actually, I, I raised it when we were back in the set before. Oh, sorry, I missed it, Linda. Um, that's all right. I'll, I'll just say briefly that the, the items six and seven, that is to um, improve the, the picture for racial and social equity, um, that's a big issue for us and for the ACLT. Uh, and we find ourselves um, just, just not equipped to understand what we can legally do. If the town can find ways to go beyond marketing to the populations that we want to encourage, that would be a great help. I, we, we recently got a donation of land. Uh, and one of the things the donor wants to do is to write into the record of the gift her desire uh, that the property eventually come into the hands of people of color, specifically African Americans. And we said that in the meantime, she sold it to the sitting tenant. Uh, but um, in terms of what the trust can do and the town in general, uh, the more we can open up policies that, that point the way to really encouraging uh, if not requiring that that properties be available um, to populations that have been discriminated against in the past, the better. I understand that's a hard challenge. I just want to put a voice in there to say that that um, some creative work on potential remedies would be all to the good. Yeah, well, uh, I appreciate that. You know, it goes out back to the discussion about our picking up on the fair housing responsibilities and doing that in collaboration with the Human Rights Commission. Right. I do have some experience with the university's effort to house its students. I, I, I don't think I have anything that you probably aren't already aware of. The university is proceeding with public-private partnerships, the project that they're going to build, uh, that they're launching on um, Massachusetts Avenue, I believe. Uh, some part of that is such a public-private partnership. So I think they're moving a little bit beyond what seemed to be a roadblock for a long time uh, to actually being able to do that. Uh, the more long-term view is that one of their concerns is that it, uh, it's extremely difficult at this moment in time to predict what the long-term likelihood is of any continued growth in the resident population. It, a more likely prediction is that it will shrink. Uh, and, and that drives some of their willingness to tie up buildings and capital in that. Yeah, I've heard that. Um... Basically, right now, their capacity is to be able to uh, house about 14,000 students on campus. Mm -hmm. And the number of students that are enrolled that make use of the Amherst campus, this is, that is, I'm excluding people who are distance learners, is uh, 28,000. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine the gap between 14,000 and 28,000 is going to shrink very rapidly. And uh, my impression is that, as I said, students would, not everybody, but a significant number would live on campus if they had the opportunity to do that. But once they get into their third or fourth years, 
or maybe even their second year, Sid would know better than I would, that opportunity probably shrinks significantly. It, it, it does if uh, the students choose to go off campus and then come back on campus. Um, it traditionally, if a student is um, like for their uh, first year, second year, to third year, they choose to stay on campus, the chances of them continuing on campus is actually pretty good. Um, okay. What they do is, however, they, they will go off campus and then try to get back in. That's when yeah, they, they don't have priority to get back on, on campus. Okay, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, the, I mean, as you pointed out, Linda, they do have uh, the first of a public-private partnership project beginning. It was supposed to begin now about two years ago mm -hmm. um, when they eliminated housing at North Village. <coughs> and the Lincoln apartment housing has kind of been up in the air also. <clears throat> so they aren't moving very expeditiously uh, to add the net new three or 400 units on campus. Um, I, I hear you saying that they're doing it because they are reluctant to overinvest on new residential programs. Um, my sense is from talking to other people that the university has lost its capacity to subsidize on-campus housing. And as a consequence, uh, that's the major reason why they're not willing to build more on-campus housing, because even under a public-private partnership or whatever else they might be doing, it's just too expensive. And I think that drives a lot of their reluctance to invest further. I don't know if anybody else has an opinion on that. Sorry. Okay, anything else on, uh, uh, on the issue of what, if anything, we might do related to the issues in UMass or is it really something we wanna leave to town council. Uh, hey, John, I've, I've been listening. I have been here for a little bit. I, I do agree with Sid that I think, um, you know, town gown relationship could be strengthened. So, I mean, whether or not the trust is a part of that or just, you know, recommends that, you know, I thought when UTAC was meeting, <laughs> it seemed like there were some really good discussions. Um, and, you know, I think it's been quiet for a little bit, but I think that you know, just having those open lines of communication are good. Yeah, UTAC dissolved when Amherst changed the charter right. and the new town council didn't pick it up, but I'm not sure the university pressed for its reestablishment either. So I think that definitely is in town council's court at this moment. Right. I mean, you know, I think, you know, for instance, the gateway project, which some neighbors didn't approve of, but on the UTAC report, they did identify some areas where it could make sense to have, you know, um, higher density for um, off-campus student housing that could be privately developed, um, you know, and I, I think that's a good idea, uh, but, you know, I feel like it's a, could be a long road, but I think it's worth a, worth a conversation worth have, having because, um, you know, it is a town problem when, you know, so many of the single family homes or other private properties are rented to students and it's forcing out um, non-students. And so, um, yeah, I just think that it's a, a balancing act and I think it's good to have that conversation available. Okay. Maybe it will be helpful for the, for the trust to say, to say, hey, town council, we would strongly support you do, getting going with this uh, town gown thing. If it's mm -hmm. kind of laying, not doing anything, knowing at least that there was somebody that thought it was a good idea might help it get started. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could endorse the reestablishment of town gown and indicate our willingness to participate if we were asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to Roman numeral goal, Roman numeral three, please, Lucia.
Okay. So now we get into an area that is less closely related to our regulatory responsibilities, but not that it's unimportant. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, one of the three or four opera related proposals that we have on uh, is related to this. That is uh, funding changes to the sustainability of existing multi-unit buildings, which uh, are not necessarily uh, heated or cooled using electric resources. And as a consequence, they tend to be inefficient and they uh, are environmentally poor conditions. On the other hand, this has not been a major issue for us uh, until really we did a forum on housing and sustainability with the environmental, uh, uh, what is it, climate and uh, I can't remember, what does ECAC stand for? I've lost it, sorry. Energy and Climate Action Committee. Yes, thank you. Okay, so this is something that, again, we might not want to take the lead in, but it's something we might want to collaborate with uh, uh, Stephanie, who's the town sustainability coordinator, and also with the, uh, Laura Dracker, who's the chair of the ECAC. Comments, thoughts? I think it's important, but I also think that, you know, we could take a supportive role maybe in partnering with ECAC if that's their primary goal, but maybe not take the lead on some of it. Right. Other comments or thoughts? Uh, okay, well, that's something that we could do in collaboration with um, uh, Stephanie Ciccarello and uh, Laura Drauker, but as Allegra said, we wouldn't necessarily want to take the lead on it. Uh, goal four. That actually is something that we've done something about. Uh, again, if you look at the RFP for East Street and Belchertown Road, at least for that housing. Um, one of the things we uh, expected of a developer is to uh, assure that it's constructed in ways that address climate action or sustainable and resilient. Um, so, I assume we continue to do that kind of thing. Is there other thoughts people have about that? It just seems like we do it in in conjunction with the house, whatever housing development or renovation or whatever the heck else we're doing that it, we do it in conjunction with that kind of not as a separate thing. Right. Um, I, I agree exactly or entirely with what you're saying, Carol. Um, the ECAC wants to do it in a way that addresses the kind of existing capacity of all the housing and also the commercial property in town. I mean, obviously that's a long haul, there's a lot to do, but it's not something that we would necessarily want to take the lead in or have a strong supporting role.
Okay, so basically, with respect to goal Roman numeral four, we want to continue what we've been doing, but we don't want to do a whole lot more than that at this point in time. Okay, so we're on to goal five. Um, and basically, this is about maximizing the available financial resources. Uh, it doesn't really propose new resources, um, but it at least gives us some support for calling on CPA funds, the community development block grant funds, other revenue sources, which could include um, uh, the, um, the fees associated with uh, short-term rental properties, which may come at some point in the future. Actually, it would also include resources like town property that becomes available. Um, again, something that we've already done. So uh, could include, although it's not named here, tax incentive financing as another way of adding resources that would be available to support affordable housing. I kind of look at all of this a little bit like the town policy creates a kind of hunting license or hunting license. And what it means is that we can try to look for what potential opportunities are there that we think are feasible and select among those and say, okay, we want to move in this direction and town council, we want your support to do that since you created this policy. Doesn't this one, the one that says that that the town council will proactively engage the Amherst, the housing trust in moving forward on developing identified properties and working to establish and receive new revenue and funding programs to support. It's, it's kind of says they're going to support us, at least the way that I read it. The yes, I agree. This... So basically, <clears throat> basically, it puts us in a position of saying you committed to this. Here's a particular property or a particular initiative that we want your help on. Yeah, so yes. So we just have to find those opportunities and then push them to support us. I say just as if that was gonna be easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other comments on this goal? Again, I think for the most part, it's it's consistent with what we have been wanting to do and already been trying to do. I have a question, um, and I don't know where this would fit in, but I'm wondering about the role of kind of trying to keep the affordable housing that there is affordable still. Um, because I've, I've in speaking with Kevin on the housing and rehousing working group, it seems as if a lot of people are being displaced right now because units that were once affordable are being renovated and then the rents are raised and people are displaced. Um, so I, I wonder if there, there's where that goal would, or that idea of trying to, I don't know, keep affordable housing that's already in existence affordable, if that would it, fit. It, it, it is in there, but it mostly refers to, for example, um, housing that's owned or managed by the Amherst Housing Authority. Um, so that, for example, if they have a building or units that are threatened because they're out of date or they're running into various kinds of problems, then that should be a priority. But what we don't have, which I think is what you're talking about, Allegra, is where housing isn't formally identified as affordable with a capital A, 
um, and whoever owns or controls the housing decides uh, the rent they've been offering at is too low, they could get more for it. And so they do some renovation and essentially the people who have been in the housing lose it. And there are definitely examples of that in town. Um, I can think of a particular example of someone who um, is a custodian in town. Um, he's held a variety of other positions. He was living in housing like that with his son. I guess from his point of view, the good news is that his son had graduated high school before they were forced out of it. But even so, he would not have left the community if the housing had remained affordable. But in essence, whoever his landlord was decided that they wanted more for the housing and uh, he was forced out. So I think that's what you're talking about. And I don't know how we address that. It's a very good question. Uh, but legally, housing that has been affordable uh, is not necessarily covered by any of this. Well, I think, uh, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's the capital A affordable, right, that has deed restrictions that's yeah. on the subsidized housing inventory. So those units, um, you know, we'd have some leverage and ability to make, keep them affordable. Um, you know, tenants can, they still can be evicted from affordable housing if they can't make payments or certain things. But I think what John is talking about is our units that don't have any deed restrictions or, you know, any mechanism to, uh, to you know, there's no rent control, right? So there's no mechanism to control how much the rent can increase. But for the ones that are deed restricted, um, we've maintained those pretty well. You know, we in invested over a million dollars in Rolling Green to keep 41 affordable. We've worked to uh, do a few uh, first time home buyer programs with Valley to keep some of those units, um, you know, with affordable um, homeowners. But, you know, I think in general, we don't, you know, the town doesn't have much, um, you know, authority over the market in terms of market rate units. So, if there's a landlord who decides to increase his rent beyond the voucher program, you know, we might find out about that after the fact because, you know, someone might tell us, you know, vouchers are no longer, um, you know, voucher holders can't apply here or they, they don't work here, but we don't really have any um, leverage with them necessarily unless somehow we probably have a lot of funding to buy down the units over time. But it is a difficult thing to monitor the kind of lowercase a affordable units. Yeah, I mean, vouchers are a general problem. Um, I, again, I, people may already be aware of this, but uh, the Amherst Housing Authority, which manages the voucher program, uh, has a difficult time assisting people in leasing up in Amherst because the rents are so high and they go above what's allowable under the mobile voucher program or what used to be called the Section 8 program. And I don't know what we do about that. But it's consistent with what you were raising, Allegra. I can't find it now, but I thought I read something in here that was kind of amazing to me that it said in this whole bunch of things that could be done, possible municipal regulatory strategies. I thought one of them was look into the possibility of and then there were words that sounded to me like it meant rent caps, but it didn't say it that way. It was something that we talked about once once before, trying to see if there's any any kind of way to look at bringing back or bringing in some kind of you can't charge more than this for this. Um, yeah, I, I could be wrong, I, but I believe the town would need legislative authority to I be think, able to uh, do that. Yeah, I th I, I believe that's true too, but that doesn't mean like some other things in here where uh, I forget the thing we talked about earlier, where the first step would be to get some legislative authority to charge some of those fees for, uh, oh, selling really expensive homes or some of those other things. Right, the, I, transfer. I just, the transfer fees. It's yeah. just, it's just another thing that probably won't go anywhere at least in a very long time if ever but it's 
there there have been such things in other places and yeah. um yeah so i think there are something like in here somewhere tw 20 or 30 towns that are now lobbying the legislature on the transfer fee um That's for cool. high-end real estate transactions so maybe we'll be closer to that i don't know if, if mindy's still here if she has anything to say about that she's here mindy is there anything you want to add on that I don't want to put you on the spot, so you don't have to say anything. But if you do want to say something, you need to unmute. Sure. Thank you, John. Hi, everybody. And I first, want, I really want to say thank you for all of your work. I know you, I, I try to attend these meetings and be a fly on the wall, and I can't keep up with you. Your meeting and your meetings are always incredibly sub substantive and have heart. So I just, I really want to thank you as a resident of Amherst for your hard work. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of bills in the state house regarding transfer fees on housing. Some of them are home rules, meaning they're specific to particular towns, and some of them are statewide that would allow for local option. So, for example, um, Rep. Dylan Fernandez, who represents communities like Martha's Vineyard, um, has a transfer fee home rule for Martha's Vineyard that would um, create a fee for houses over, excuse me, over maybe, I'm not exactly sure what the number is. It might be several millions of dollars. And um, those, that transfer fee would then go into a fund to support the development of affordable housing on the island. Um, Martha's Vineyard has a very particular issue that's not that different from other communities, but um, the people who work on the island can't afford to live on the island. So um, they literally have to migrate to the island to be able to do their work. Um, and there's practically no affordable housing on there. So that's an example of a home rule because it would only really apply to Martha's Vineyard. There are other bills out there that would try to do that on a statewide option or give localities the local option to do that. Um, but the other home rule that's up in the legislature that I thought really sort of um, it reminded me of what Amherst was trying to do that I brought to John's attention that he mentioned earlier in the meeting is Somerville, which is I think a real leader in um, trying to create um, innovative ways to generate revenue to support affordable housing. They also deal with a population um, crisis in terms of the housing crisis that's similar to ours because being in Somerville, they have a lot of students who go to the colleges in Cambridge and also in Medford in, at Tufts. And so they have this increasing pressure on their housing market as well. And their home rule, I don't know what chance it has of passing, but it really sort of speaks to, I think, Amherst's dilemma on what to do about home, non-homeowner occupied housing um, translation out of town LLCs that scoop up these housing and then rent them to many students and, and kind of take them off the market for low to middle income uh, families. And so their home rule is a transfer fee specifically on homes that are being sold to or from non-home owner occupied LLCs. So it's very targeted at if you're a company and you're, in, you're out of town and you're not going to live in the house um, and uh, you're basically renting it to people who aren't also from the town or coming into the town, there's going to be a transfer fee and then that fee goes into a pot of money to support the development of affordable housing for low to middle income families. And that one I really got excited about because I had heard that the Amherst Town Council was struggling with a way to deal with the non-homeowner occupied scenario. And I think Somerville has figured out, at least for themselves, one way to do it. They have not yet been successful in getting this through the legislature, but I think this is a situation of um, more towns need to sort of come together across the state to build momentum for support for transfer fees for affordable housing. And um, I'm happy I've talked with John I'm in, and I'm continuing to work with the reps from Somerville to learn more about what statewide coalitions they're part of and how I can learn more about those efforts so I can bring them back to you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mindy. Sure. Uh, yeah, I am in touch on and off with Ellen Schachter, who's 
the head of Somerville's Office of Housing Stability, who keeps coming up with these kinds of ideas that we so should smart. all want to copy. Yes. Yeah, she's a former legal services attorney. And actually, uh, her husband taught Paul Bockelman's one of or more of his children in the Somerville schools. <laughs> well, I've heard you know, recently. If you have yeah. specific concerns or questions that you'd like me to sort of uh, do research or dig up information on, please let me know because I'm more than uh, that's part of my role as an advocate is kind of taking whatever information you have and your concerns and trying to find out information that can meet it, even if it's not um, in a bill that's flying through the house, which no housing bill actually flies through. Um, <laughs> but at least connecting Amherst to other places. Thanks, Mindy. I didn't know if it would be helpful also, and I don't have to do this now, I can actually send this to you in writing if you'd like, for me to sort of update you on what's in the state ARPA bill regarding housing. Um, I could do it, um, I could send it to you tonight, or I can wait until we see what the governor does because he still hasn't signed it. And assuming he signs the housing portions, I can send it to you once he's signed it so you can have it. That would be great, thank you. Sure. Okay, so we've spent quite a bit of time on this and we've got other things to do, but I do wanna at least cover a little bit more. Um, one of the things that the town council adopted was setting a minimum goal of 250 new units of affordable housing, which again, I thought was great. Um, and this is consistent with uh, affordable housing plan that we had proposed to town council now I think three years ago but it's great that they adopted that part of the plan and that it is now part of town policy and again I think that's something we should definitely be reinforcing okay Lucia could you move down a little bit further and um the rest of these tend to be things that either are redundant with stuff we've talked about before or things that are more difficult for us to get involved in. Uh, people may have seen the data that a high percentage of renters are cost burdened or severely cost burdened. And the question is, what, if anything, can the town do to try to reduce the extent of cost burden on renters? I mean, again, it's consistent with what Allegra raised earlier about uh, cost burden really driving people out of their housing uh, one way or another. Uh, again, I don't know whether we want to leave these items in or things that we want to try to tackle. Obviously, we do want to tackle the third one, reduction in the number of homeless individuals served at Craig stores. Any other comments or questions? I feel like I've uh, exhausted your patience with this area of work. Um, so again, I, I don't feel necessarily strongly about any of the rest of it. I mean, there's a list of potential municipal funding strategies. They may be things that we'd like to see. Um, and I think we would probably support anything town council does in those directions, but I'm not sure that uh, there's something for us to do except to take advantage of it if they adopt some of these new strategies. So again, unless there are further questions or comments, I think I'll close out this part of the agenda and we'll go back to uh, all of the various reports um, most of which are short, but some of which may generate some discussion. John, would it be possible for us to get this document that you put together by email just to kind of review? Um... It absolutely would be, Electra. And if I had done it more than a couple of hours or completed it more than a couple of hours before this meeting, I would have emailed it to you. But I will do that so that everybody will have it. And if you have further questions or comments, please let me know. 
I think what I'll try to do between now and our January meeting is draft a, uh, a memo to town council, which we can deliver in January, we can deliver in February. I wouldn't want to wait too long, um, but I think it's a good time to do it as the new council is forming and people are kind of getting their feet, feet wet. And uh, again, where I think there's a lot of willingness to address affordable housing issues. So I'll do that and that will also be something we can take a look at at our next meeting. Okay, so thank you all. And let's go back to the rest of the agenda. Um, the next item I had on the agenda, um, and I'm sure you're sick of listening to my voice. So I've asked Lucia to report on this, and that is where we are <clears throat> in uh, working with the town on a survey of older adults. Hi everyone. Um, so John and I met with Becky Bash of PVPC who has um, conducted the survey in various other towns in the region and Helen McMillan, Maureen Pollock and Brianna Sunrid all from the town on Monday. And it sounds like PVPC has at least several thousand dollars in funding to be utilized but not funding for um, mailing out surveys. So that would come, that would be the responsibility of the trust. Um, they're currently working to establish a working group, including the new um, senior center director that will meet um, monthly and discuss proposals for the town to make it more dementia and age friendly. Um, and this working group will also agree on the finalized version of the survey. So the survey is not finalized right now um, and it is open to suggestions for changing the questions, but John suggested that it looks like it suffi sufficiently meets the need of the trust. So didn't suggest any changes. Um, let's see, John proposed to the group that we, for the random sample that we mail out 500 surveys and then a few weeks later, follow up to those people who did not respond and anticipates that about 35 to 40% would return the surveys. Um, for online surveys, they use SurveyMonkey, which um, Becky Bash was pretty adamant about keeping it, it through SurveyMonkey. And Brianna confirmed that there is a way to set up duplicates so that we know where the surveys are coming in from so that we're able to separate the random sample from, for example, people who get it from the senior center or something somewhere else on Facebook or something. So that will help keep the random sample results separate. Becky uh, expressed hesitation on the PVPC's ability to do data anal analysis if the results are disaggregated that way. So this would likely fall on um, maybe me and a couple of other UMass um, volunteers working with John to, to sort of analyze some of the data. And then Brianna also offered to help drafting an engagement plan and community mapping, which I think um, based on what I've seen John send me, he's already worked on that himself a bit. Um, and then there was one concern raised by Helen, which is outreach for the convenient sample for certain groups like Meals on Wheels would require um, social workers reaching out and there would not be capacity for that until the late spring. But other than that, the timeline is hopefully um, the working group will first meet at the beginning of January. They'll have their second meeting by early February and agree on the finalized version of the survey and it will be ready for dispersal as of early February. I don't know if there's anything else you would like to add, John. I think I did distribute a copy of the Hadley survey to people no. a month or so ago. Is that right? Or did I actually keep that to myself and not share it? Nobody I certain. You, I thought you did distribute John some the survey question, some survey questions. I can't remember. Yeah, it, it would have been the Hadley version. Yeah. Did we go yeah. over it in the meeting? I don't know. Briefly. Briefly. No, I don't think we spent yeah. much time on it. So it isn't necessarily memorable. <laughs> Um, my own 
view of it was that about 20% of the survey is devoted to housing. Then there are ancillary items that would be helpful to us, like the age and race and ethnicity of respondents and so forth. So I actually didn't see much of a reason to change it. Uh, but I can redistribute it. And if anybody has any suggestions, uh, you can send them to uh, Lucia and I, and there's something that we could ask the task force to consider when it meets. Um, probably, yeah, I, mean, John, I think, sorry, the task force, you know, they're not looking specifically at housing. I mean, that may be one component, but it's really, um, as Lucia said, trying to make Amherst a kind of an age friendly, you know, community with a number of different factors there. But, you know, I think it's right that if they're doing this outreach, we could augment the survey and the findings, and then, you know, also get some information about housing. Uh, it could aid, you know, aid in place, um, age in place programs or just other services for seniors that, you know, is relevant to housing. So um, I think that's, I think it's a good thing. Also with the new health director, I think there is probably some push to do some community uh, assessments probably in the next year, year and a half. And I think that's something the trust could also um, work with John kind of, you know, as, you know, just offering support and as you're doing with the, this, um, this, you know, kind of this progress or this task initiative that, you, you know, you and Lucia are helping with, I think the trust could also help with a community health assessment too and have housing be tied to it. I think that just gives us more information. Um, I was going to just give a quick update. There is money. The planning department has some money to do a housing production plan update. You know, the last housing production plan was hmm. almost 10 years ago. Um, however, I've been told that the census data is not, might not be ready until next fall. So the <laughs> detailed data that we'd use right now, there's just basic data. So um, I've spoken with, you know, with DHCD and there's a round table discussion. And so they're, you know, they recommended not starting it now because some of the data would just not be current, uh, which is disappointing, but we, we have some money for that too. Yeah, the UMass Donahue Institute is the regional location for US census data. So I, I'm not second guessing what you just said, but that would be, those would be people, people to check in with because right. they would hold the regional database that we'd want to be accessing. Yeah, and I, I can look again. Yeah, I mean, they said there's some kind of surface level data, but it hasn't been um, refined. So you, can, you know, couldn't cross-reference. So you couldn't get more detailed tables. You can get some you know, larger numbers, but not some of the detailed stuff. Yeah, they actually had detailed information about race and ethnicity. For some reason, maybe not surprising, that became available early, but in the meantime, uh, everything else seems to be on hold or waiting. Right. Yeah, I have a couple of contacts at the Donahue Institute, so if you remind me, I can check with them, okay, see yeah. if they know anything more than you or I do. Um, okay, well, that's all good. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to give Allegra a chance to report on what is happening with the committee on the future of the seasonal shelter in Amherst. Um, so we have been meeting less frequently than we met over the summer because over the summer we were really focused on trying to get a place for this fall. Um, operations are up at Emmanuel Lutheran so Craig Stores is operating out of there for the season. The hope is um, that some of the ARPA funds will be used to potentially purchase a property that the town could use for both shelter and possibly um, like day space for case management services is kind of the conversation that the service providers in the group um, kind of centered around. Um, there has been one property that the town has seen and that members from Craig's Doors have seen separately that they were excited about um, and the town might have some other potentials that aren't necessarily on the market that they're thinking about. Um, so we're not necessarily privy to some of that information, but the kind of consensus among the group so far has been that it would be great to have a 
permanent location and for a shelter to be operational, not just in the winter, but year round um, and have space that could provide places to meet with case, you know, case management services, whether that's housing search services or health services or you know, employment search, um, warming and cooling. I guess right now, Craig's Doors is operating out of the Manual Lutheran Church. They're busing people up to Amherst Survival Center for showers. They're busing people or, you know, people are taking public transportation down to the VFW for a warming site or that would, that's the plan if it hasn't opened yet. So it's, you know, there's three different locations that people are kind of bouncing around between at this point. And it would be lovely for all those services to be able to take place under the same roof. Um, so that the, you know, the hope is that ARPA funds can be used to move forward on purchasing a property that could be utilized as a long, you know, permanent shelter site. Um, and I think part of our conversation has been also, um, there seem to be a lot of things in the works in terms of permanent supported housing, not just from, you know, possible town funds if, if the CPA funds go towards the town's proposal for, you know, some permanent supported housing. Um, but there are other kind of statewide things coming down. Um, I know there are some safe haven. That's in Franklin County. Yep. So Franklin County will um, will manage that. Um, Actually, I think it's ServiceNet or yeah. would be the contract holder, although I'm not sure. Yeah. And that think, may, may be yet to be decided. Yeah. Um, from what I'd heard, it would at least be located, you know, focused on Franklin County or, or you know, operational out of Franklin County. Um, and there is a potential site in Northampton being looked at for like 16 medically compromised individuals leaving chronic homelessness. So there, you know, I think part of the conversation has been that because although the majority of um, people staying unhoused in Amherst identify Amherst as their home, there are people coming from Northampton, coming from East Hampton, coming from Holyoke and Springfield. So it is a regional issue that we're dealing with. So there are other towns nearby that are also working on some of these you know, permanent supported housing initiatives that could potentially take in people that are staying in Craig stores as well. Um, and I know the University Motor Lodge is still, you know, those units are there, but they're basically offline. They're, it's not like they're turning over every night. Those are basically kind of almost operating as permanent supported housing at this time because those people mm -hmm. are stable in the in that environment. Um, and they are, they have, again, um, Kevin Newman was saying they have seen about four evictions recently, one of which was a previous rapid rehousing client who had been staying in, in town and is now displaced because of the property renovation that took place. So they, they have seen an increase in people looking for services because of the rents rising in Amherst. Um, and that's not just from this one particular property in the center of town, but they're saying, you know, they're hearing anecdotally that some of the apartment complexes that are traditionally thought of as more affordable have also been bumping up their rents because some of the newer buildings that are coming in are more expensive. So, you know, the market rate is going up. Um, so they are, I guess, the, you know, they're, they're, kind of request to the housing trust in, in terms of support there was making sure that the, the lower, you know, the 30% and under AMI don't get left out of the conversation in terms of developing further units and with the understanding that the Northampton Road units will be coming online at some point and that is geared towards that population, but that, that won't necessarily be enough to fix the problem in Amherst. Um, so that that is still a population that's in need of permanent housing. Um, so I said a lot and I don't know if it all made sense, <laughs> but I don't know if people have questions or comments, concerns. It does make sense 
was there any further discussion about the potential competition for resources between having a permanent location for the shelter versus developing a transitional uh, housing program? There wasn't really. I mean, I guess, um, I guess because it sounds like there are some other sources of funding for permanent housing, permanent supported housing coming, whether that's through ARPA or through there are a few RFRs I think are out right now. Um, one I think is there's there's one that just came out that was um, I think for working with people who have opiate use disorders, so opiate use disorder rapid rehousing, but, um, and that's a statewide RFR that just got put out. Um, and there was another similar um, I think rehousing RFR. So there are there is some there are some other funding sources out there that at least some of the other people in the room were aware of. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I'm not up on everything, but. Yeah, it's kind of difficult to keep track of it because um, there are, the main resources come through the Department of Housing and Community Development, um, but some of it comes through uh, the uh, Office of Substance Abuse Services. Some of it can come from the COC, the Continuum of Care, that gets money from HUD. So you never know quite where those opportunities are going to materialize. Any other questions for Allegra? Okay, let's move on to a couple of other things. Um, let's see. Um, Nate, where are we um, for other people with the Strong Street property evaluation? Yeah, the Strong Street, the, um, the consultants are hoping to get out there, if, if it wasn't this week, next week. And so they're, um, they're delineating the wetlands on the entire property. They're also doing then uh, soil testing on what would be considered upland just to see. Um, not they're not going to do test pits, you know, with an excavator. They'll do um, some hand digging and hand borings, uh, and then do a concept development or I think it's like up to three uh, development scenarios on the property, and also you know how to bring in utilities. So um, I'm hoping that's underway. You know, they he said they definitely get to it next week, if not this week. So. Um, you know, they're not, they don't have to survey it. There was a survey done, uh, you know, it's, it's old now, but it's recorded and they looked at it and they thought it was, was detailed enough and, you know, accurate enough that they didn't have to resurvey. So that saved costs. So their services are costing about $5,000. And from there, it'll just be, you know, I think it'll help inform the town and the trust. What, you know, what are the options for the property? What do we, what do we think? Um, you know, if the wetlands are pretty extensive, then, you know, that's one thing. If they're not, then that's, that's all right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm told that the property is, has a lot of ledge or rock on it. So I'm hoping that they can determine that. Um, and maybe that based on their development scenarios, we would actually have to um, maybe have someone go out there and actually with an excavator and do a few bigger test pits to determine soil type and whether or not it's feasible to get utilities up there. Um, so, you know, I think in the next few weeks, we should have something to to look at. Um, would it be possible for us to schedule a report from the consultants at our January meeting? Yeah, I'll I'll email uh, tomorrow and see if they you know what if that if they can do that. Okay, because that would be good. Yeah, um, that will give us a chance to get an overview and to ask questions and to get a better idea about what we might or might not be able to do with that property. That would be great. Right. Okay, um, I just wanted to briefly go over what's happening with the review of proposals for the East Street School uh, Belchertown Road project. Um, uh, the review committee met earlier today. I don't think I'm breaking confidentiality to say that that uh, happened. It was essentially a kickoff meeting. There wasn't a lot of detailed discussion. Um, the group includes Dave Zomek, uh, Amy Ruseka, who is from the Department of Public Works. She's the Assistant 
director. Um, Rob Mora, um, who people may know, is the town building commissioner. Uh, Sid, myself, and also from the finance group, Holly Drake and Simone Christofori, who's the new town procurement officer. Holly is there to assist uh, Simone and to provide some training in her role as uh, the new procurement officer. Um, I had originally thought we could form a uh, subcommittee of the trust to uh, support Sid and I in our review of these proposals. It now turns out that I was misled <laughs> and we are not able to do that for reasons of confidentiality. People probably saw Nate's note, so we're not gonna be able to do that. Um, two proposals were submitted to the town one from Wayfinders and the other from Home City Development. And they're both good organizations, so I'm optimistic that we'll have two good proposals to choose from. Uh, the other thing that uh, I wasn't aware of until uh, really a few days ago is that there is an added element to the review, and that is the, uh, the two firms that are making proposals will be asked to do a presentation and respond to questions probably in early January. And the goal is to wrap up uh, the committee's report to the town manager so he can make a final choice, uh, I would say no later than mid-January, possibly even a little bit earlier. So that's where we are with uh, that process. I'm not sure if there are questions that I can answer them, but I can try. <laughs> okay, then uh, earlier, Carol had asked about ARPA funding. Um, and I, if you know Nate, one, I didn't know whether or not town council had approved the proposed spending plan that the town manager and town finance director had proposed or not. And second, assuming town council is going or has approved it, when uh, Sean would be coming back to us and saying, okay, now I need your specific recommendations for how the money relating to housing and homelessness should be spent. Sure, yeah, the town council did approve the general ARPA plan and so, you know, there's the million dollars for housing, a million dollar for million dollars for homelessness, and then there's some money for social services, which could be, you know, tangential to housing. Um, I think the goal is to have um, programmatic guidelines uh, ready in March or by April one. Um, I think Dave Dave Zomax, you know, kind of in charge of the housing money. So he he or Sean may be reaching out in the next few weeks, John, to you. Um, it sounds like, you know, we don't, they'd like to have, you know, say if we want to do three programs, we'd want to have kind of like what we started having a summary goals and objectives, measurable outcomes, a reason why um, it's needed. Um, and then, you know, how it would be implemented. So I think the work the trust has already done is, you know, we're in good shape for that. So I think, um, you know, maybe it's just now working with staff or, you know, reaching out to Dave to see what, you know, how we want to get started on that. Um, but they didn't approve anything specific. So it's just the general, you know, we, we saw what Sean presented to us with some just general categories. And so really it's now a chance to refine what, what those are, you know, what, what programs would we be doing? So. Um, okay, so we'll know presumably pretty soon um, when we need to uh, take what we've already done and put it in a form that uh, works for the town. Right, I, I have a meeting tomorrow. I think staff, we've been, staff's been meeting this week with Sean. So I just, I have a meeting tomorrow to learn more about it. Okay, um, any other questions about that? Well, um, maybe it'll be on our agenda again for the next meeting um, to talk more specifically about what we would prioritize among the things that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Let's see, I also have another report to do on Community Preservation Act. The committee is meeting tonight to finalize their uh, recommendations to town council. Um, from the most recent interaction that I had with Sarah Marshall, who's the chair of CPAC, um, what I believe may happen, and again, don't take this to the bank, but uh, what I believe will happen is that CPAC will not approve either of the larger amounts that we requested or the town requested for major uh, support of housing projects. It's not that they will disapprove it either. What they would, would do is take us an amount of money, maybe as much as $600,000 and bank it so that if we come up with something that requires that funding between now and the time town council acts on their recommendation, which could be April, May, I'm not quite sure, then it could be reallocated, taken out of the bank, so to speak, and reallocated to a specific project. Um, now, I'm not absolutely sure, because Sarah wasn't sure that that's what's going to happen, but that was my impression about where the Community Preservation Act Committee was not as of tonight, but as of a week ago. If anybody else has any further information, this would be a good time to add it. No, I, no, I don't either, John. I think that... Um... You know, the CPA committee did have a lot of proposals this year, and I think they will in the coming years. So it's getting more competitive. They, they, they were discussing trying to fund a lot of the proposals at reduced amounts. And there was some discussion, like John said, to try to keep some money in reserve for housing projects. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure what, what they'll do. Yeah, I, I, I will say that when I attended the CPAC meetings, there was a lot of support among the membership for using money for community housing. And I think that's one of the reasons why there is likely to be this reserve. Mm -hmm. It won't necessarily be for housing per se, but I think for the people on the committee who are uh, most committed to assuring that we have more money for community housing, um, they want it there so that if we come up with something specific, there'll be money there to fund it. Um, I think they're reluctant to just put it in the housing trust bank or uh, allocate it to the town because their attitude is it really should be for a specific project. And also, if it's an amount as large as half a million dollars, they probably want to bond it. They don't want to spend all of that in any single year, but they want to spread it out over a number of years which is what bonding allows. So I think that's why uh, we're not gonna see our request for project money approved in the amount that we, that we asked for. Carol? I, maybe it's also because if they can't approve both the one from the trust and the town, because that's too much money, what if they approve the one that doesn't fly and then the other one doesn't have any money? If they hold on to it, they can go with the one that comes up first. Yeah, and it isn't the <laughs> necessary. I, I agree with what you're saying, Carol. Um, they might also give us a kind of consolation prize under any circumstances of another $100,000 to hold in the bank that we can use for due diligence on projects that we're considering. You know, like we're using money to do the evaluation for the Strong Street property. So we may get some money, but a smaller amount, but the majority of what we ask for um, is likely to be in that reserve. And also, I don't necessarily see it as uh, a victory for us or a victory for the town if money goes one way or another. Um, I don't think we we would, oppose what the town wants to do with that money. So I think either way, um, it's a victory for affordable housing and that's what we wanna see. Yeah, I mean, I'll say that the CPA committee did ask you know, a fair number of questions of the housing proposals. And I agree with John, they're reluctant to 
to, um, you know, capitalize the trust with funding, although it's allowable, it's, you know, the trust is, I, I mentioned at a meeting that there, I said it again, um, I repeated myself again at one point that the trust is named, at, you know, in, in the statute as the one place that can just, you know, bank CPA dollars, but I think they're uncomfortable doing that. So, um, you know, I think we just can keep trying. Yeah, it has to do with the culture of the committee right. as it's existed over time. And they, their inclination is to want to see a specific project and if it's a large amount of money to bond it. And, and I think, you know, yeah, every other category, whether it's, you know, open space, recreation, historic preservation, it is for a specific project. And so it's unusual that for housing with the trust, you don't have to have a specific project. So I think they're just so used to you know, allocating money um, project by project and not just saying, okay, we can just provide money for future projects. Um, they really like to have that, you know, that project basis. Um, and, you know, they're newer members. I feel like they were really keen on that this year. I was kind of surprised how much they really wanted a project. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, Tim Neal, for example, is a newer member on the committee. And he was very excited about the possibility of community housing, yes. but he wanted to see something specific. Right. Uh, so that may be the way we need to look at things in the future, that if we don't have a specific project, there almost is no point in asking for a large allocation. Um, also on my list was Hickory Ridge. I assume at this point, the town is still waiting uh, for whatever it is that's holding up being able to close on the property. Because uh, otherwise I think we would have heard that the town's about to close. Yeah, uh, the, um, yeah, I have another, I have a meeting on that tomorrow too, actually on the restriction on the property. Um, you know, there is the solar company and then there's a conservation restriction on some of it. And so there's a lot of moving pieces, but as far as I know, there's still, I thought the goal was to close in mid January um, and get everything lined up by then, but. Not know. to be critical, Nate, at one point you thought the goal was to close in mid October. I know, <laughs> or you know, I, September. I, 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 honestly, <laughs> I still think the owners of the solar haven't heard about their rebates from the state yet. And I, that's, that's one of the reasons it's been delayed so many times is that the, the financing of the solar hasn't been um, worked out. And so, uh, they're not, you know, they're willing to work with the town until it is, but it, for some reason, they're just not, they're not hearing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as our conversation with Mindy indicated, there are things happening in the legislature. I don't know, Will, is there anything that you want to uh, have us focus on? Well, um, there is the, uh, the state ARPA funds that are before the governor right now, uh, um, which has, I think it's, it's like $600 million of uh, money that's earmarked for housing. Um, yeah. The specifics, I don't know if, uh, if, if Mindy's still on the line and wants to speak to that. I know she mentioned sending us the specifics in an email, um, but uh, basically it would be awesome if all of that money were you know, available is immediately or as soon as possible. Um, I think that if the trust wanted to take an action, you know, we could send letters to the governor and encourage, you know, town council and others to to do the same. Um, the uh, I see that um, you know the the coalition and homelessness um, has like a form letter that we could pretty easily just send their way um, to, and have other folks broadcast that as well. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's that's how I would suggest we focus our energy. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd be surprised if the governor didn't approve it, unless he's concerned that it's not enough money, because he originally had proposed, I think, a billion dollars for housing and homelessness. Yeah. Well, um, Will has suggested that we send a, a letter to the governor supporting the legislature's plan uh, for housing and homelessness within the ARPA funding, state ARPA funding. Uh, is there, I'll take that as a motion. 
Okay, well. <laughs> Sounds good. Is, <laughs> is there a second to the motion? A second. Second. Thanks, Lagra. Okay, so I guess we can vote to decide whether uh, we'll send that. Uh, I guess, uh, Will, are you in favor or opposed? I'm in favor. Sid? Yes. Uh, Rob? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Carol? Yes. And I'm in favor. Okay, so I, I think we'll, uh, we are taking you up on that suggestion. And uh, I guess I can go to uh, Pamela Schwartz's website and find that letter, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Right there. Okay. I can you okay, great. Yeah, actually, if you do whatever is needed to complete it, that would be fine. And then sure. we can send it along to the governor's office. That's great. Great. Um, anything else we should be taking up? If not, we're one minute to nine. So we're in danger of finishing on time. <laughs> OK, well, I thank everybody for participating tonight. I think it's been a productive meeting, and I think I have a pretty good idea about what's going to be on our agenda uh, for January. And actually, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, the January meeting will be on lucky January 13th. <laughs> so if I don't see anybody or everybody before then, I wish you a happy, healthy new year and a great holiday season. And we will reconvene on January 13th. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good Thank night. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.